Hi, everyone, and welcome to AXA Coral Live. We have an absolutely fantastic lesson for you today. This is our exam grade lesson on human activity and the coral ecosystem. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome Mark, um, who is the science director at Kamabi, who will be helping us understand that relationship between humans and the coral world. Uh, Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Mark, how are you? Um, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's still morning here on Curacao, and I'm very well. Thank you. And uh, Mark, before we dive into this uh, lesson, we've got uh, schools from the UK, USA, Ecuador, France, and Romania um, joining us today. And some special shout outs. Um, we have Maya in Brittany. So good morning, good afternoon to Maya. Good morning. Uh, we have, uh, good afternoon to classes 10T1 and 10T2, who are tuned in at Chilton Trinity School, and that's in Bridgewater in Somerset in the UK. So hi to all the year 10 uh, students there. Yes. Uh, and we have, hello to everyone. Uh, we are the students of 10th grade from the Gutenberg Schule, and they are in Ecuador. And they're very excited to take part in this event and they really enjoy knowing more about corals and the importance of protecting this marine ecosystem. Mark, before we get started, um, you've been very kindly hosting Coral Live at Kamabi uh, for the past few years. If you could just briefly introduce um, this idea of having a, a field research station and, and your role. Um. Yeah, the, the two sort of go together in a little bit. Um, as a, I guess as a small child, I was very interested in what lived underwater. Uh, at some point, um, I liked the warm water more than the cold version. And then uh, coming to the Caribbean, uh, I also saw that like a lot of the uh, organisms that live underwater are more interesting in uh, warm water. So I decided to stay. So that's how I ended up in the Caribbean on Curacao. And then, um, because a lot of people think similar, uh, that there's like a lot of interesting stories we can learn and study on coral reefs, well, then you need some sort of a place to uh, study them from. And that's why when people started building research stations all around the world, uh, close by coral reefs, so it would be easier to study them. And you didn't have to bring everything in suitcases and sleep in a tent and then go back home. Uh, having a house right next to the reef is making it a lot easier. And that's what Kamabi here in Curacao is trying to do. So you're, you're, this is a science research station. The, the, the coral reef is probably 100 meters in one some direction. I'm not sure which direction. Um, uh, like with Zoom, you never know where it is. Um, but uh, yeah, it's right here. I can jump off uh, out of this chair, walk for one minute, jump off a pier, and there will be a coral reef right there. So it's really easy to, uh, to work here. Absolutely um, amazing. And um, just a quick note on interaction uh, before we get started um, with the live lesson proper. Um, there are two ways to interact. Uh, we have the YouTube live chat um, on the side of the screen. So please do pop questions into that. Great to have an adult logged in um, with their YouTube account to achieve that or on the Encounter EDU website, EncounterEDU.com, there is a small uh, white speech bubble in the bottom right-hand corner. And if you pop in a question there, that will go to Sim, um, who is part of the team and moderating today. And then that will get passed um, to Mark and myself, and we can get your questions as part of the uh, conversation. Just to let you know, um, two types of questions. So if there is a question um, of clarification, if we're using a term that you don't quite understand, um, if we've gone over a topic too quickly and you want further information, we will come to those questions as they pop up um, just to make sure we are working at the right speed for you guys. Um, but if there are broader questions, um, then we will come to those at the end of this live lesson. So the last sort of 10, 15 minutes we'll give over to all your questions and we'll, we'll come to those sort of deeper, wider questions, whether it's about careers, the future of the coral reef, um, some examples from Curacao that we haven't covered. Um, that's the time to get those uh, to us. Um, Mark, we, we, we had this great introduction um, from Michelle, who, who's based at Kamabi 2 yesterday about the coral ecosystem. Um, today, I'd love to cover a couple of things. Um, around this idea of human activity and the coral reef, the relationships between humans and coral. 
I mean, one of the things that I'd love to start with is, is this idea of, of value of nature, uh, of, of how, of how mm -hmm. it can be useful to us. And there's this concept of ecosystem goods and services. And I was wondering if you could briefly describe what that means um, to the students watching. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, a good uh, thing to bring up. Um, so the easiest way to think about it is actually maybe by starting off an example that everybody already uh, knows, which could be um, the local forest in your neighborhood. Um, so what does a forest do? Forests make wood, and we use wood to make tables and chairs out of. Um, the fact that the forest provides us with wood is a good that the uh, forest provides. So that sort of illustrates why um, ecosystems can provide a uh, f service or a good to people, even if you don't like forests. So for people that are like, ah, I don't want to go in a forest because I don't like trees or I find it scary, uh, you still need a table, you still need a chair. And that's why uh, this forest, although you don't want to go there, still does something for you. So that's a good, that's pretty much something that you can uh, harvest from it. Uh, that you can take and make into something else, something that you can sort of see. Then there's other things like the like services, and, and in a way, it's almost like the postal service. It just happens and you don't be, even uh, realize it. It's like the postal service, like letters end up in your uh, house and you don't really know how they got there. Um, so it's something similar that uh, forests, again, as an example, do as well. And a service that a forest provides, for instance, is making the air that we breathe. And that's, for instance, something that everybody uh, worries about. So even, again, if you don't like uh, forests, they still make the uh, air that we breathe, and therefore they're very, very important. And then uh, you can sort of use those two things, the functions and the services, not only for forests, but also for a lot of other ecosystems. And for coral reefs, uh, what you see is that, like, similar to wood, so something that is produced, uh, coral reefs, for instance, make uh, fish. Like uh, a coral reef is pretty much uh, a forest on the water. It's a big three-dimensional complex in which other uh, organisms can live, including fish. So the fact that you have a reef makes that there is fish that you can then, similar to wood, harvest. And then a service, so something that's like less easy to see, the coral reefs provide are, for instance, that um, because coral reefs are made of uh, corals and they're made out of limestone, so they're almost like rocks, and a coral reef is all these coral colonies together, like rocks sort of like forming a wall. And this wall that is on the water pretty much protects uh, houses that are on shore uh, during storms and uh, hurricanes and that sort of thing. So the fact that you're um, house is protected against storms is something that corals do, even though you don't want to go in the water or you don't like corals, um, it's, they still do something for you. They still provide that service, which in this case would be coastal protection. Well, I mean, absolutely fascinating. And, and recently, uh, researchers, scientists, teams have, have started to put a monetary value on some of these uh, goods and services. How, how does that work, and, and is that useful to us? It, it, it is an extremely useful uh, approach. And the reason why that is, is because if you talk about uh, coral reefs and you want to protect them, uh, a lot of people think like, oh, there's the biologists, and they want to protect everything, and, you know, go away. Like, if it's uh, up to biologists, they only have want to protect stuff. And they're never willing to sort of think along, think about what we want. They only want to protect nature. And it's true that like uh, other than biologists, there's other people that maybe want to build a hotel in an area or th there's other groups of people that, that sort of all fight for that space uh, where coral reefs occur as well. If you don't want to talk about like all these different groups, so there's the economy people, there's people that want to build hotels, there's the biologists, there's people in the government, you sort of need a language that everybody understands so that everybody can compare, here's what I want, compare it to what another person wants, and then sort of see what's most important. And the easiest way to do that is by putting a money uh, value on it. And then again, you can go back to that uh, force, like what is a tree worth? 
you could say, well, it's worth the oxygen that we breathe although that's maybe a little hard to calculate how to put a value on it. But like with wood, it's a little easier. So you can take these functions and services that uh, organisms, trees, or systems, forests, corbies, provide and try to put a money uh, value on it. And this is sort of uh, uh, very simple in, uh, for some cases, because you can sort of say like, okay, we're making a lot of money right now because of fishing, uh, because people want to come dive and see coral reefs. If we take all the reefs away, like how much money would then go away? Because people cannot fish anymore, so they cannot sell it and make money. Or tourists that spend money uh, in hotels, they won't come back and actually spend money in hotels. Like if I take my reefs away, how much money disappears with it? Because the people that want to use reefs for fishing, for tourism, would also uh, go away. And that's how you can sort of calculate what a reese is worth, because if it wasn't there, you wouldn't make that money. Uh, the other way that people sort of look at it is, um, it's almost like a lottery approach, as to like reese could be worth a lot of money. Um, if you, for instance, uh, think about bio exploration, like a lot of people want to discover medicines, turns out reese are... Um, very good places to look for the medicines and therefore potentially worth a lot of money. But that's all very new. We don't really know enough. And then the other way that people look at it, and that's another way of calculating how much uh, a reese can be worth, is that, for instance, if you take that coastal protection example, uh, you say you have like 100 houses on shore and water is rising because of climate change, there's more storms, and these houses become more and more uh, um, sort of endangered by this water that comes closer and closer, especially during storms and hurricanes. But if you have a reef, it is that underwater breakwater, it protects those houses uh, from uh, being destroyed by waste. So then you can say like, okay, how much would it cost to rebuild all those houses, which is a lot of money. And I don't have to spend that money because that reef that's on the water actually protects it during these storms and hurricanes. So it's money that I don't lose and therefore, thanks to Reese, I don't have to spend it. And then people use that as well as another way, in addition to the direct contribution. So that's through fishing and tourism mostly. Uh, calculate how much uh, money is being saved because you don't have to build your houses over or have to build your own artificial break walls on shore. Mark, I mean, so some people would argue that nature is invaluable and that by putting a price on it, um, we, we, we can sort of almost make it sort of disposable or swappable for something else. Is, is that, uh, a, what do you make of that view? Um, th that is a, a, a thing that people say, and you could also say nature is not valuable at all because like diseases are in nature too, and we want to uh, get rid of it. Um, the problem there is, however, that uh, while we understand much and much better how things relate, it's not that you can sort of um, take certain aspects of an ecosystem. You have to either deal with it all or it doesn't even work. You cannot take out the diseases and then like, okay, now I have a clean ecosystem, all the gnarly animals and all the... Uh, gnarly diseases are out of it, it just doesn't work anymore. So an um, ecosystem is something that you get as a whole, and then you can sort of uh, think again about this, this function of providing oxygen. Well, you know, if we don't have oxygen, then uh, what are we going to do? Uh, if you don't have... Uh, Reefs. I mean, a lot of these islands are built by coral. So the, the rock that we're sitting on right now, that this uh, whole station is built on, is actually old corals that died and new one grew up. And, and that big rock that you get from that came out of the water at some point. And that's what we're living on right now. So if you don't have nature, I mean, we pretty much wouldn't be here either. We wouldn't have places to live. We wouldn't have air to breathe. And you can go on and on and on and on and on. It's just not an option. Um, I, 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 there's this um, paper that came out um, about six years ago now, um, looking at putting a value on um, the coral reef sort of per hectare. And it came out this astonishing figure, I think about $350,000 per hectare, something like some $10 mm -hmm. dollars per year. And I think we've got a pie chart that we can just put up on screen now. 
Does, does it surprise you that coral reefs have come out as one of the most valuable ecosystems in the world? No, not, not really, because again, if you think about the um, Caribbean, for instance, the biggest uh, economy that people take part in is tourism. And 80% of the people come here because they want to sort of uh, enjoy the water. And then uh, a lot of people then think, yeah, but that's weird because um, uh, nobody, uh, not everybody jumps in the water or goes dive. I just go sit on the beach and lie in the sun. And that's how I spend the Caribbean. I don't have to be on the water. So if those coral reefs are there or not, it doesn't matter. So why are we so important then? Well, I just said it. People want to go lie on beaches. Every beach, if you take, uh, if you Google the Caribbean, the only thing that you see is pictures of the Caribbean, and it always has like a white beach where people are uh, lying on. That is what makes the Caribbean attractive. Um, the fact that those beaches are there, every beach that is made out of white sand is actually made by reef organisms. Um, so if you have a reef and corals die, there's that limestone uh, that sits there, and then there's sponges that eat away at it, there's uh, parrotfish that scrape it, and they make that big limestone boulders into sand, they pretty much. That washes ashore, and that makes the, the beaches. If you don't have reefs, then uh, there's no sand being made anymore, your beaches disappear, and then people don't want to come anymore. And we already know, we've seen places where um, uh, islands where coral reefs have degraded very, very uh, uh, much, that beaches indeed start disappearing and people didn't want to go to those islands anymore because of the fact that there is, uh, yeah, that they're not there. So if you think about like what we're just talking about, like what are the surfaces that uh, reefs provide, sand production is one of them too. And sand production makes for beaches. Beaches attract a lot of uh, people to the Caribbean. And then th this entire, entire uh, because there's a lot of islands, there's a lot of people coming here that obviously amounts to a lot of money. So yes, it is not surprising that coral reefs are um, very valuable, even if you don't want to jump in the water yourself, as for example, shown by those beaches. And I mean, you, you've covered some great examples. We've got, we've got tourism, we've got food, um, we've got even sort of the small economy around, around scientific research. Mm -hmm. um, we've got that uh, coastal protection piece that you covered. One of the pieces you, you mentioned was that how the genetic diversity of uh, the coral reef might, and this lottery idea, might provide us with medicines uh, for the future. Are there a couple of, I mean, that sounds quite weird that we're, we're, we're getting medicine from, from the coral reef. Could you describe maybe a couple of examples of, of where we are with that? Yeah, and then and, and first of all, it's actually not surprising at all, maybe, because um, I guess everybody's sort of heard that like coral reefs are the rainforest of the sea, uh, because they're equally to rainforests. They're very biodiverse. Uh, th there's, however, a big difference, and that is that like uh, rainforests are made of plants and coral reefs are made by animals. So on a, on a healthy reef, you almost don't see plants. They're all animals, corals, the animals that live in there, uh, sponges, fishes that live around it. So a coral reef is very biodiverse. There's a lot of species, and it's all animals. If you want to uh, look for medicines that work for us, uh, we're animals too. So whereas in the past, people would go to the rainforest and then use the uh, uh, biodiversity there, which is basically equivalent like, to a lot of options that you have to find a medicine because it's almost like a lottery. You have to try a lot of things in order to find one. So the more biodiverse something is, the more species there are, the easier, the more you can try. Um, but then again, you find like a plant that makes a medicine against a plant disease or uh, against mushrooms overgrowing it. And then maybe because sometimes people are attacked by mushrooms too, uh, that medicine works for uh, us as well, but we're not plants. If you then start looking for the same sort of things, uh, these medicines on coral reefs, you actually take it from a sponge or a coral, but then again, like we as humans are way more related to corals and sponges than are related to plants. 
So the chances that you find something, a medicine that these corals and these sponges are already making for themselves, that it is going to be something that works for animals, us, is way bigger. So that's why coral reefs are so uh, interesting, because uh, like rainforests, they're very biodiverse, but they're actually dominated by animals, animals that make substances that are going to work for other animals, including us. And that's why, for instance, right now, most of the medicines that are being tried, I think it's 80 or 90 percent of the medicines are being tested uh, right now, are actually derived from uh, organisms that grow on coral reefs. So in a way, and then that, that's also just starting, uh, there's a lot of organisms that we haven't tried yet, we haven't looked well enough in uh, so th there's almost this sort of cabinet of medicines uh, with the doors closed. And then like if we would open them by starting to look in there, you might find medicines against diseases that are uh, incurable right now. So there's huge potential to use these substances made by animals on coral reefs and see if they're actually useful for us as well, especially in a time where uh, a lot of the medicines that we used to use, the ones that came from plants, are no longer working because you know a lot of diseases evolve as well and we're in a, some sort of arms race with them. So we have to find something new and coral reefs are a good place to go look for these new medicines. Amazing. I mean, Mark, thank you so much. I mean, that I, I've always found it amazing that this valuation of nearing ten trillion dollars uh, a year has been put on the reef. But just hearing some of those examples, and I think we have a summary slide that we can show um, that coastal protection, whether it's um, you know you don't have to rebuild the cost of rebuilding a house or even putting in a sort of an artificial um, break, um, that tourism piece, the science research, the food, the medicine. Absolutely incredible. Just as a switch over, talking about you know not just what the coral reef can do do for us um, and livelihoods and everything else, but also what our relationship in in affecting the coral reef is is talking about this idea of tourism, and and you've you know mentioned how important the coral reef is to tourism. Does tourism therefore have always have a, a, a positive effect on, on looking after the reef? Um, that sort of depends where you go. Um, there is, of course, a lot that we know now that we didn't know 10, 20 years ago. So it's automatic almost that if you look at uh, people on vacation, uh, 10, 20 years ago, that they're doing things that we don't do anymore. Uh, an example of things like that too is like, uh, you know, you sometimes see people riding these giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands. People don't do that anymore because there is awareness that in this day and age that you just don't do it anymore. So there's there's a awareness like that within tourism, uh, tourism as well. So for instance, um, People on vacation, normally I'm on vacation, I can do whatever I want. Uh, they sort of cut corners, if you will. They eat more fish than they usually do. Uh, they don't worry about their waste as much as they do at home because they're on vacation and they're only there for two weeks. But even small islands like this, you know, if we get a million tourists a year, and that's a lot, if they all do one of those things, um, it adds up pretty quick. It's, for instance, also that um, a tourist, oh, I'm on vacation, I use a lot of water. Uh, a tourist uses 10 times more water a day than a person living here, which uh, makes that the sewage treatment plants cannot deal with it anymore because there's too much wastewater coming their way. And because they would otherwise overflow, they have to dump it in the water. So you do see that with... Uh, Tourism and then tourism where people just want to lie on the beach, read a book, maybe swim in around every now and then. Um, that islands like this suffer to deal with the waste stream that comes with it because there's so many of them. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. And then the other uh, thing is like if every tourist uh, wants to eat one lobster and uh, say in Curso, uh, every tourist would do that, you would eat a million lobsters a year. And there's not a million lobsters on Curso. They would all be gone in one year. And that's just an easy example that even if people uh, eat fish or things like that, that quite quickly, uh, there's so much food needed 
uh, that um, an island like this is not capable of providing that in a sustainable uh, uh, way, which means that like what we have here, our natural resources on the rich uh, coral reefs are sort of slowly disappearing, or at least they become overfished, for instance, corals start dying because all this excess uh, sewage water ends up in the ocean. So there's for sure a good and a bad to it. Like, hey, it's the tourists that come in to see your coral reefs, but at the same time, by doing it, you kill them at the same time. So it's almost like you're killing the geese with a golden axe to some degree. But it's good to know that people are more and more aware of that right now. And then mostly due to technical uh, uh, innovations, you know, techniques are now available to better clean wastewater and, and do all of this smarter. So it's going to be interesting. The effects are large, but at the same time, uh, people know how to deal with them. And people actually want to deal with them because you can sort of see that a lot of people now uh, are considered eco-tourists. Tourist, uh, tourists. They, they actually come to see these uh, uh, reefs. They expect them to be there. And the people that provide hotels or governments know that if these reefs disappear, sort of what we talked about in the beginning, if these reefs disappear, then all that money that these tourists bring doesn't come anymore. So now there's huge incentive. And again, that sort of underwrites the uh, value of... Um, or the, the, the method to describe the value of a coral reef in money. Because the whole uh, governments on many islands are not willing to do something, not because they per se care so much about corals or that there's a hundred coral species. It's so special, nobody cares. But everybody knows that like if those reefs disappear, the tourism money uh, disappears. And therefore that made for a strong incentive to not actually start treating water better and make sure that reefs don't become overfished. So it's almost going in the right direction. Mark, it sounds like an incredibly difficult balancing act uh, for a whole range of stakeholders. Now, I know that uh, students watching from the UK studying for their exams uh, really love to have case studies. Is there a case study um, either in Curaçao or more broadly in the Caribbean that you can think of, of, of where this sort of ecotourism future is doing really well. Something you could you would you would like to hold up as a as a good example. Well, one of the um, the examples there is actually a lot nowadays. So one of the things that happened here in the last uh, month is that um, people that want to build hotels had gotten permits where they can build these like huge hotels with hundreds of rooms, ten stories high, and they could pretty much do uh, whatever they want. Uh, they didn't have to make uh, sewage systems. They could just build one of those huge blocks right next to the water and do tourism. What you see now is that the people that are already allowed to make uh, those hotels are now, uh, we don't want to do that anymore. We want to have the zoning plans changed so we can more uh, go in an eco direction. We want to have small little houses in nature, uh, sewage systems, electric cars, and make it such that like what we build doesn't affect uh, the nature, uh, both on land as in the water. And that's sort of interesting because the only reason why people uh, or why a lot of developers change in that direction, people that build hotels, is because nobody uh, wants to live in these big hotel towers anymore, or at least not in Curacao. So you see that there is this, this growing success of ecotourism. People want to see what's on land and on the water. Curacao is in a good position there because we actually have very nice reefs. Everybody now realizes that um, these reefs need to be protected because otherwise you don't get the money uh, from the, these ecotourists. And both the government as well as the developers uh, know that like tourism like we used to do it two, three decades ago is not more what these people want. If you don't do the ecotourism with eco lodges and small scale, uh, they won't even show up. And, and is that going to make it more expensive for tourists? Is, is, could you say that sort of the future of sort of overseas nature tourism might become more exclusive? Um, maybe. Uh, it, it, it is true that like people go on vacation and that, um, for instance, a lot of people now pay 
sort of a lot of money to go to Costa Rica or Bonaire. Those are both islands and the country that are very well known for uh, its ecotouristic product, if you will. It's like jungles in uh, Costa Rica, it's coral reefs on Bonaire. And islands like this, Curacao, have sort of seen these two examples and they're like, oh, um, with less and less and less people uh, wanting to stay in uh, hotels because you know, if you want to go lie in the sun, you can do that at home nowadays in one of those little ovens that you can put on your attic. So if people go on vacation, they go shorter, they pay more, but it has to be, um, it has to make an impression if you go somewhere. And that's sort of the ecotourism uh, uh, perspective, but it's also for uh, historic or cultural reasons. You want to go on vacation, not to lie down, uh, but you want to experience something. And then for the people that are interested in uh, nature or li like to be in the water, then all the islands that still have coral reefs, because there's a lot of them that already lost it, the islands that still have coral reefs now all at once see the value that the demand of these tourists, uh, hey, show me something that's really, really cool, uh, that they have it. And now it's a time where these have to be brought together um, so the economies of these islands can benefit from it. Well, I mean, and we could talk about this sort of at length almost in a lesson in itself, but we, just what I want to make sure that we, we, we cover sort of um, some of the other threats to coral reefs. And I think we've got a sort of a, a summary um, slide to be able to show and, and really sort of looking at three groups of threats, one of which is water quality, mm -hmm. uh, physical damage to, to, to reefs um, from, from storms or from overfishing, and then this uh, high CO, CO2. Um, perhaps we can start with high CO2, and this is something that young people may, may have seen in the news. Um, I know we're sort of jumping sort of rapidly, but, but how, how, does, uh, how do carbon emissions or, or increased carbon emissions affect the reef? And in, so, in general, and then in, in Curacao. So the, the way that that works, um, so we all know, that because of burning fossil fuels, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is way too high. The earth gets warmer. If the earth gets warmer, the ocean gets warmer. And that's sort of where the problem arises. Um, because like corals live together with very tiny algae. Uh, you guys probably spoke about that already. And these algae uh, start making sort of like a toxin when water becomes too warm. So the coral that has these little algae inside its body is like, uh oh, they start making these toxins. You know what I do? I'll just throw them out. They can go make their toxins somewhere else, but not in my body because like, I cannot deal with it. Um, in itself, that's not a problem. Uh, so corals do that when water gets too warm. And then if say a few days later, water gets colder again, they take those algae back in. These algae make food for the corals and everybody just keeps going as if there were uh, nothing had happened. But if it's, lasts too long um, and there's like weeks and weeks and weeks of warm water, these corals cannot take these algae back. Uh, and because these algae make food, they starve anyway. And because they starve, they die. So that's one big problem of uh, climate change is that these uh, algae are expelled so that corals then starve and die. Uh, the other one is, is that like uh, with all the CO2, it goes into the ocean and it makes the ocean turn into vinegar almost a little bit. and you know, everybody now knows that corals are made of calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate dissolves in vinegar. So you have all these corals that try to build a skeleton and build skeleton and build skeleton. But then if the water around them, because of high CO2 that sort of whoop, makes it into the ocean, uh, dissolves that at the same time, it's almost impossible to uh, build your house on the water. So those are the two... Um, sort of ways that uh, climate change, warmer waters, algae gone, and uh, the vinegar aspect uh, cause that climate change is not really making it easy for corals to do their thing nowadays. And are you seeing those processes happen uh, on, on the reefs um, where you are, or is it mainly on, on, on other reef systems? Um, we're sort of lucky in the, in the sense that there's a weird sort of current uh, close to Venezuela that brings a lot of cold water to the surface that flies by here and that sort of cools the reefs more than in other places in the Caribbean. 
Um, so we don't get it as bad, but we do get it this year. It's actually one of the uh, worst examples, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's the, uh, the the sort of problem. Uh, you see, so you see it happen even here. Uh, there's not much you can do about it. Like if if uh, all of Curacao would uh, start driving electrical cars or whatever tomorrow, I think it, there would be a zero, uh, zero point z uh, seventeen zeros one uh, contribution to reducing CO two on the uh, planet because Curacao is so 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 tiny. It, it, and that's the big frustration is that like all these islands either um, because rising sea level they go on the water or they see their reefs disappear there's not much they can do about it the only thing you can do about it is uh, sort of taking local action because if you take local action then you sort of see that these reefs are as fit as they can be and it's not that like uh, uh, coral reefs die all the time and that's the only thing they can do if you make sure that like water is clean and that like uh, fish populations are healthy you actually see that like those reefs even if they get hit by bleaching and global warming like when conditions are slightly better again they sort of bounce back and that's something that these islands can do and are doing and in other places that have done it in the past already um, it's actually working as well thank you Mark. i mean super interesting there and 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 the sort of looking at this what is called a multiple stress environment where there's lots of stresses on coral if you can remove some uh, of, of these you know stresses whether it's through cleaning the water so taking out the sewage that you talked about sewage pressure from from yeah. hotels if you can reduce the fishing impact then they're going to be more resilient there's a question um here through from union point um in kentucky um and it's just interesting to know from, from the view of Curacao, because I know that different reefs across the world face different issues, but what's the biggest impact that humans are currently having, the single biggest one on, on, the, on the reef in Curacao? Um, I would say that there's two that sort of contend for that position. And uh, one is overfishing. Uh, and the other one is the uh, sort of older pollutants, because it's a lot of things. People always talk about like, oh, it's sewage and it's nutrients. But there's also diseases in there, and it's the same diseases that make us sick and corals and fish. So sewage is like this, this almost this mix of all the gnarly things you can think of. Um, so those two factors, overfishing and all that stuff that we generate on land, that we throw in the ocean, uh, are the two main pathways by which people now uh, make the life of corals harder than say 40, 50 years ago. And and just following up on you know all the stuff we we throw in the ocean, there's a question um, come through, and this is from Maya in, in Brittany, is is asking whether sort of plastics and mi microplastics are proving harmful to the reef. Um, yeah, because like like with a microscope, you can start looking in um, in corals, and then you see that like uh, even in uh, corals in healthy places uh, because people throw plastic off ships so it's it's pretty much everywhere in the in the ocean uh, that the same way that people show these pictures of these birds that are full with plastic and that's why they die uh, that you find it in corals like i to be honest don't necessarily know how bad it is for them but it is a little bit shocking to sort of find it wherever you, you look um, so yeah, the, it's a good one. Like uh, microplastics is for sure another thing that sort of runs off islands, ends up in the ocean, and does things that we might not even know uh, how bad they are. And and you you, you talk about the sort of o overfishing piece beforehand, and I mean I, I think that you know certainly we, we we have this you know well documented fishing of large species of of sharks and everything else. Does that just mean if you swim offshore, there are just no sharks, or does that harm the ecosystem health as well? Um, the, that sort of depends on how far back in time you want to go. <laughs> it's funny, I found a book here, and it was uh, it had pirate stories in it from the Caribbean. So it was a captain driving around the Caribbean, and then every time that somebody on his boat did something bad, they would keelhaul him. So I hope that people are familiar with it. You tie somebody on a rope and then drag them underneath the boat. So in the full year that this man was traveling the uh, Caribbean, he had done that to 98 people. Um, 
they got all eaten by sharks. So if you would fall in the water 300 years ago in the Caribbean, you'd be eaten by sharks. That's how many there were at the time. Um, when we started researching coral reefs, you know, those days were already over. And sure, there were more sharks 50, 60 years ago when research sort of began, but it's nothing uh, compared to what it was before. And that's sort of a problem because then if you don't know what a reef used to look like when people were almost not there, it's very, very hard to uh, figure out how it uh, sort of works. So right now, um, I'm not a big fan of putting on fins and start swimming a kilometer offshore because you do sometimes see uh, sharks and they're pretty big if you uh, run into them there. Uh, but I would rather do it now than say 300 years ago. Um, so things have changed. But then again, the fact that you do see one every now and then also means it's not gone yet. And what I try to say by that is like, if you take action right now, it's like, oh, against this sort of background where people are sort of aware that shark finning is not what you do anymore. There's all these sort of things that people consider uh, not normal anymore. They want to see action taken and it actually starts happening. So while a lot of the shark abundance of coral abundance has sort of changed through time, it's not zero yet. So with a little bit of help and you see that happen in places where people make protected areas, where fishing stops, give it 10 years and a lot of these systems are still capable of bouncing back. So it's close, but it's not too late yet. Um, and, and here's a question coming through related to overfishing. Um, it's from Belen Salazar, the Gutenberg shooter, in, um, I think in Ecuador. Um, if you had the chance to penalize people who illegally overfish in protected areas, uh, what would your penalty be? Uh, Hopefully not keel hauling, um, but what, what kind of penalty do you do you think that people should face? Um, I think what you uh, the, the problem is, and this is sort of an other interesting thing. If you uh, it's a good question actually. If you start thinking how everything is related, so it's not bees that relate to biologists. No, there's the economy, there's uh, coastal zone people, and making a fair system. Uh, for those that break the rules, like uh, in this particular example, has uh, proven problematic. So what you now see a lot too is that people from social sciences jump into these sort of discussions to decide what to do. And what I'm trying to say is this, like right now, if you're caught fishing in a protected area or with uh, spear guns, which are illegal, you have to pay uh, 1,500 guilders. 1,500 guilders is the average income of a person on Curacao. So people cannot pay it. If you cannot pay it, you have to go to jail. They lose their job. Their wife and kids at home have no money because the guys in jail are not working. And then they have to go steal. So now we also see that like, if um, um, you don't do this well, it is very, very disrupting. And you can say like, ah, we got a guy and he's uh, illegally fishing. Let's get him, put him in jail and uh, it sort of works, but not entirely, because it has these social consequences. And what people are thinking about right now, instead of putting a fine on it that's absolute, so 1500 for everybody, uh, let's do 20% 20, 20 of your monthly income. That's going to be the fine. And then if you're on the poorer side of things, you would pay 20% uh, of 1500 guilders. But if you're the owner of uh, a big company, you would have to pay a lot, uh, because it's also... Uh, so that's what people are thinking about to sort of make sure that not only do you have a system with rules, but also uh, a system that people think is fair. Because if people think um, it's not fair, they're not going to help you. And then this whole idea of let's jointly uh, make peace better in the future is not going to work. And I imagine, I think, working on community projects um, in, the, in the Pacific region, we saw the importance of community education and also taboos so that you'd be socially excluded if, if you were caught uh, fishing in, in, in protected areas. Um, yeah, and that works in certain parts. It's a little harder here. Like the busier it gets and the, the more different groups, um, yeah, it becomes problematic. Often the, uh, they don't have to be convinced that it's a bad idea. Uh, and so, and therefore like a lot of fishermen know a lot about fish. So it's really stupid as a science person to sort of go lecture him on fish because they know it, maybe from a different perspective, but 80% of what you know is the same. Uh, the only reason why they uh, uh, still do it 
despite the fact that they know it's a bad idea, is because they think that if I don't do it, somebody else will. And they think that because there is no clear rules and regulations. And then you see, uh, in most cases, uh, that you make rules and regulations that are fair for everybody uh, and that are enforced. So everybody sees, hey, if somebody breaks the rules, there's consequences. That a lot of people are actually willing to fish less, don't do certain things, uh, that then will in the end help towards a uh, healthier uh, coral reefs. So this uh, compliance goes up if you have a fair system that is sort of the same for everybody. And you know it might actually take some time to design those for places like this, like Russo. Well, we're, we're pretty well out of time, but there's, there's, I'm just sort of going to bundle two themes that have come out of our questions. It'd be great to get your view on that. Uh, from a government point of view, and then from a community uh, or project point of view, what two examples would you love to hold up and get scaled in terms of the right balance uh, between people and the coral reef? You mean how all these groups work together to no, sort I mean, of work towards the... example, like you're saying, Bonaire have really got it right, and I'd love to see this model stretched across the whole world. And I think this group working out of this lab, doing this great work, I'd love to see that scaled up too. The, 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 the Bonaire is uh, for sure a good example. Um, the, um, the thing to keep in mind though, is that like, especially of what you were just saying about taboos and local customs and you know, fishing might be more or less important on an island. I don't really think that there is a model that you can sort of take in one place and bring it somewhere else. And I would then argue is that the realization that like tailored approaches are needed for whatever island that you go uh, are required to make sure it's right for that place, that you uh, take into account the local uh, concerns to uh, a large degree, and that there's a great need uh, to sort of uh, make people aware of that in the first place so they don't take something, oh, here, this works in Australia, so it must work in Jamaica too. It's not going to work that way. So the more people could get involved into designing these sort of tailored solutions for all these different places, um, I think that that is the thing to realize. And then, you know, this is just starting. So the more uh, people join in to design those. And then, for instance, that again, as for uh, a lot of people that are not a biologist, as for the technicians that build sewage plants, it's asking for the social people that sort of understand uh, the social consequences of uh, enforcement, for instance. And then if those all come together and work together, um, I think we'll we'll get somewhere. Mark, I mean, that's a really lovely note to end on. This live lesson has been designed specifically for students studying geography, GCSE, um, in the UK. And to, to hear that, you know, that role of human geography and the social sciences playing such an important role, understanding place, understanding societies and understanding science and bringing those all together. Um, so th thank you so, so much uh, for sharing your knowledge, experience and insights um, about the reef and about how we use it and sometimes abuse it. Uh, and thank you to all those students who've been watching. Uh, we will finalize a slideshow with notes and, and diagrams for this and attach it to the live lesson. Um, but thank you again and look forward to seeing you tomorrow when we have um, another live lesson looking at more on the solution side uh, to some of the threats uh, that the coral reef faces. Until then, thank you so much for being part of Axa Coral Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.